Greetings everyone. A very good morning to all of you. I am Mehrin Saba. Today I will be your Master of Ceremony. Thank you so much for coming here today and to have our today's roundtable with Dhaka Tribune on non-traditional security threats in the Indo-Pacific region. Without further ado, I would like to request our respected moderators, Major General Munir Zaman, President of BIFS and the editor of Dhaka Tribune, Mr. Zafar Subhan, to give their welcome remarks and to moderate the rest of the session. Thank you so much. President Sir, over to you. Thank you, Saba. And a very good morning and assalamu alaikum to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, distinguished participants, a very warm welcome to our monthly roundtable on strategic issues. And we have very rightly chosen the topic for this month's roundtable on non-traditional security threats in the Indo-Pacific region. You'd agree with me that no understanding of comprehensive security is complete without identification and understanding of the non-traditional security threats. Although the issues of state-centric security or hard, hard security remains as important as ever, yet there is a complete new school of understanding on the non-traditional security threats, which are mostly non-military in nature, and the sources of threats also are non-military in nature, but they threat the well-being and even survival of people of any country or region. Therefore, it is very important and critical for all of us to understand and agree that a country is only secure when its people are secure. And to provide that degree of security to its citizens and people, we have to provide them the security that is demanded in the non-traditional security do domain. The Indo-Pacific region is particularly vulnerable to a number of non-traditional security threats, starting from climate change to food insecurity, water security, disaster management and HADR issues, to pandemics and health issues, to illegal fishing, to human displacement, and the list could go on and on. Therefore, we as members of the Indo-Pacific region need to take a particular stock of these issues so that we understand what is the threat environment in the region where we live. The current Indo-Pacific strategy that is being rolled out also has to cater to these issues of non-traditional security that threatens most of the people in many countries in the region. If I share some of the statistics with you on some key issues, you'll agree with me how vulnerable the region is. Almost 500 million people in 2020 were food insecure. About 1.1 billion people did not have access to adequate calorie level of their food intake in the region. So in terms of food insecurity, the whole region is threatened like never before. If I again go back to natural disasters on HADR issues, a figure of 2018 indicates that almost half of all 281 natural disasters that happened in the world that year, half of that happened in the Indo-Pacific region. Therefore, the region is not only vulnerable, but is greatly threatened by the threats of non-traditional security. BIPS has been identifying and consistently working on these issues for many years. We have published papers on almost all the critical non-traditional security threats to Bangladesh and to the region. BIPS is also a founding member of the Consortium of Non-Traditional Security Asia, which is hosted out of RSIS in Nanyang University in Singapore. And we have been actively working with them 
as a consortium founding member on all critical issues of non-traditional security, particularly climate security issues, of which Bangladesh stands as a frontline state on the threats of climate change. With that very brief introduction, we shall like to go to the main session of today's deliberations. And we have two very eminent scholars to talk to us about these issues. It will be first with Air Vice Marshal Mahmoud Hussain, a former aviator, a former ambassador, and currently with the faculty of the Aviation University in Bangladesh. And it will be followed by deliberations by Dr. Marufa Akhtar, who is currently the chair of the Global Studies Department at the IUB in Dhaka, International University, Bangladesh. So without further ado, we shall go to the working sessions and I shall ask, request a Vice Marshal to start the session. You would have about 15 minutes to make your initial remarks, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Major General A.N.M. Munir Zaman, President, Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies. Mr. Zafar Safan, Editor, The Daily Tribune, Dr. Marufa Akhtar, my co-panelist and dear audience. Assalamu alaikum and a good morning. The title of today's seminar has three major elements. First, it is about security threats. Second, the threats relate to non-traditional security challenges. Third, it has a geographical dimension. First, about security threats. Security threats are facts or experiences in simple terms that cause damage or pose danger to human existence. Second, conceptually, security threats are divided into two categories, traditional security threats and non-traditional security threats. Traditional security threats are essentially related to external military threats that seek to undermine the security of the sovereign state and its territorial integrity. Non-traditional security threats, on the other hand, are based on threats to the survival and well-being of people in states that arise primarily out of non-military sources, such as energy crisis, natural disasters, infectious diseases, mass migration, human and drug trafficking, etc. They are transnational in nature, which is important with regard to their origins and effects. Third, what we mean by the term Indo-Pacific. The term is also used to specify the region of Indo-Pacific Asia. It is a vast region that is bounded by the circle formed by the two oceans, the Pacific and the Indian. The region consists of 24 countries. That includes China and the United States who have veto power in the United Nations. There are four nuclear-powered states, with India and Pakistan being the neighbors. It is the home of world's 60 percent population with 4.3 billion people. That includes China and India, the world's two most populous countries. It is also the home to the world's largest economies, the United States, China and Japan, and to some of the best performing and most dynamic markets, India, Indonesia and Thailand. It makes up about 60 percent of global GDP and 60 percent of global maritime trade. Last but not the least, two of the most sensitive and geostrategic choke points are precisely located into the Indo-Pacific, namely Babel Mandap and the Malacca Strait. Since the late 2010s, the term Indo-Pacific has been frequently introduced into geopolitics. It also has a security link with the latest quadrilateral security dialogue, Quad, a grouping between India, Australia, Japan, and the United States. The concept of Quad may change the mental map of the Indo-Pacific in strategic sense. However, that is for future to tell. In recent times, Indo-Pacific has become the flashpoint of real politic of great power rivalry. Military drills by China and the U.S. protege Taiwan may have a far-reaching impact on facing the challenges of non-traditional security threats in the region. If that happens, it will severely undermine the efforts of the states to come together to fight the non-traditional security challenges that so severely prevent the well-being of the common people. 
In my brief, I will primarily highlight the areas, namely resource scarcity, environmental degradation, and biodiversity, transnational crime, human and drug trafficking, health security and pandemics, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, food and energy security. Let us start with energy security, which is at the top of global security agenda these days. For a sustainable Indo-Pacific, countries need regular and continuous flow of energy resources. Asia-Pacific, consisting of Asian states, is a subset of Indo-Pacific region. This subset region consumes more than 36% of what North America consumes of energy. The region's growing energy needs have led to a new strategic relations with other parts of the world, especially the Middle East, and have raised serious questions about energy security. Some of the security-related questions are, first, do energy needs pose new challenges to Indo-Pacific security? Second, are the supply chains through the choke points safe for continuous flow of oil and gas in the event of major war? And third, the most important, how damaging will energy be as a source of tension between states. The Russia-Ukraine war has acted as a catalyst to the energy crisis. So both China and India have turned toward Russia for oil and fuel supply, thereby demonstrating two powerful states' difficulties in taking sides with the West. However, the effect of energy due to Russia-Ukraine war has not been the same for Indo-Pacific and Europe. Europe has been badly hit for its dependence on of gas on Russia, but in case of Indo-Pacific, energy per se has not been so much of a disaster. However, the conflict brings to the fore few facts that are significant for the states in the region, such as there is a changing pattern in trade, coupled with innovative financial transaction. There is a greater reliance on the Middle East oil. There is also a greater reliance on open access to sea lanes and shifting strategic relationships that need resolution, such as conflicts in and around South and East China Sea, and freedom of navigation in the seas, which are vital for national security among the states. All these have an impact on the region's energy security, but the most important lesson is that Indo-Pacific states face the common challenge of external reliance on energy supplies. And therefore, it also promises potentials for the states to cooperate by stressing its extra-regional, exogenous character. Food insecurity is one of the most significant challenges of the Indo-Pacific region. While it does not get the same attention as other regional security issues as the South China Sea or China-Taiwan conflict, the current state of food insecurity is grim. The Asia and the Pacific overview of food security and nutrition estimate that 945 million people in the region have experienced moderate or severe food insecurity in 2019 due to limited food availability or insufficient means to access food. Compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic, the impacts of climate change and the Russia-Ukraine war, a growing population in the Indo-Pacific will be affected by food insecurity in the coming future. This means that more people will suffer from hunger, reduced productivity, undernourishment, young age ailments, and pressures of migration. One of the most affected is Bangladesh, with a quarter of the population experiencing food insecurity. Population factors, geography of watercourses and low elevation makes addressing Bangladesh's food security problematic as food cultivation and distribution is impacted by natural disaster disruptions. Food prices are among the most important indicators of what is happening to individual households' economic activity. High price levels affect households' ability to purchase food as well as the income of farmers. When food prices rise, net sellers of food gain. But when food prices decline, net buyers of food gain. In the Indo-Pacific, net buyers, such as small farmers, those with non-farm employment, and landless laborers outnumber net sellers, who tend to be large farmers with a surplus to sell. Even in rural areas, when food prices rise, everyone notices. When famine happens, everyone notices. About 40% of the region's inhabitants cannot afford a healthy diet. There is a strong correlation between human security and loss of purchasing power of food commodities. According to the United Nations, the region will be home to nearly 5 billion people by 2050, meaning more people will be at risk of food insecurity. When considered with climate change, unwarranted cross-border migration, and the region's growing population, food insecurity can prove to be the region's most pressing challenge. 
Indo-Pacific is the scene of irregular migration. Irregular migration includes both migrant smuggling and trafficking in persons. Human trafficking is of particular concern as the region ranks number one in illegal smuggling of persons. Southeast Asia has been identified as a major source of trafficking. The other issue of concern is refugees and asylum seekers. Australia is a destination of choice for asylum seekers. The Rohingya have, term, have been termed as the most persecuted commun community. Five years have passed since the last influx of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. Their fate seems to have been overshadowed by COVID-19 for the last two years, and now by the Russia-Ukraine war. Bangladesh continues to remain under its security implications. Transparency International Bangladesh has published a report named forcibly displayed Myanmar National in Bangladesh, governance challenges and way out. The report says that Bangladesh faces long budgetary constraints and security challenges because of the protracted stay of Rohingya. The TIB chief draws our attention to the dangers of emerging radicalism as the individuals who face brutality are likely to be the target for recruitment by the radical groups. In Indo-Pacific, there seems to be a symbiotic relationship between human trafficking and drug trafficking. Both fetch huge sums of money by illegal transnational crime. The illicit trade of men and drug leads to illegal arms trade. The region hosts both the Golden Crescent and Golden Triangle two global hubs of narcotics business. The favorite narcotics route is overland from Myanmar to Bangladesh, to India, to Pakistan, to Afghanistan, to Central Asia, to Russia, to Europe. A mind-boggling exercise in heroic adventurism. South Asia and the Gulf in the past were illegal, were integral to cannabis trade. Illegal, unreported, and unregulated, in short, IEU fishing is a threat to our economic security and the natural resources that are critical to global food security, ocean ecosystems, and sustainable fisheries. Globally, fish provide about 3.3 billion people with 20% of their annual animal protein intake. Around 60 million people are engaged in fishing activities globally. Estimates put around 20 billion US dollars annually in economic loss due to IUU fishing. In 2020, the US Coast Guard said that illegal fishing had replaced piracy as a global maritime threat. In the Indo-Pacific region, like elsewhere, the collapse of fisheries can destabilize coastal nations and pose a much bigger security risk, as it can fuel human trafficking, drug crime, and terror recruiting. The Bay of Bengal is a hot spot for illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. The Asia-Pacific is biologically diverse. It has 17 of the 36 global biodiversity hotspots, and seven of the world's mega-diverse countries are found in the region. It has the highest marine diversity in the world, the longest and most diverse coral reefs, more than half of the world's mangrove forest, and the highest sea grass diversity. However, rapid economic growth, increasing population and its consumption, environmental pollution, high growth of urbanization, agricultural depletion, and invasive alien species have caused extensive biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation. For example, between 2000 and 2015, approximately 135,000 square kilometer of natural forest was lost, which is 10.6% of the total, world's total natural forest loss. About 80% of the region's coral reefs are currently at risk. The region, especially East Asia, the Pacific, and South Asia, witnessed the sharpest increase in premature deaths as a result of ambient air pollution between 1990 and 2015. China, for example, contributes 1.2 to 2 million deaths per year owing to a high rate of industrialization and high dependency of fossil fuels. While Indo-Pacific is highly impacted by climate change, the region is also key to reducing greenhouse gas emissions that cause global warming. One or two words about Indo-Pacific economic framework, in short, IPEF, would be useful at this stage. The framework is critical to advancing partnership in areas that directly or indirectly address non-traditional security concerns of the participating countries such as trade, digital economy, and technology, supply chain resiliency, decarbonization and clean energy, infrastructure building, 
workers' standards, taxation, investment screening, and anti-corruption, except Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, other Southeast Asian nations are a part of the IPEF. The framework includes U.S. treaty allies such as Japan, the Republic of Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. But the forum may also consider to include other South Asian countries. I would like to conclude by saying that non-traditional security threats address the issues of security threats differently from traditional military threats. They are not immediate threats to national security as traditional military threats are, but they have long-term consequences in energy concerns, environmental sector, health issues, food autarky, migration problem, economic progress, plus sustainability of democracy. The list of challenges is long. They can be summed up in one word under the rubric of human security. I will just finish my this presentation with a statement from the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Treat human beings always as an end, not as means. Thank you. Thank you, Mahmoud. That was a very comprehensive painting of a picture of some of the critical issues of non-traditional security in the IOR. Needless to say that this is not comprehensive in nature. We have many more other challenges. So you can only understand and appreciate with me that the region is very, very vulnerable to non-traditional security challenges. As we roll out the Indo-Pacific strategy, it is absolutely essential to understand that there are great seeds of instability in the region and a major strategic concept cannot be rolled out unless we take a stock of these sources of insecurity, particularly with the well-being and survival of the people. As I said at the beginning, nations are only secure when their people are secure, when their citizens are secure, and therefore we have to analyze all the issues that are being talked here so that each of our nations take adequate measures to address them. It is also important for, for us to understand that most of these threats are transnational in nature. So therefore, we not only need to address them at a national basis, we also need to grow regional and international mechanisms to address them on a transnational approach. And those are some of the thoughts before we go to our next speaker. Dr. Maruf Akhtar, we will again paint you the other issues of non-traditional security which are important to the region. Maruf, you have the floor. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you sir. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to first thanks to the organizer for inviting me, um, President Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies, Mr. Zafar Sohan, editor the day Dhaka Tribune, and my co-panelist, uh, Air Vice Marshal Mahmoud Hussain and dear distinguished guests today. Today we are discussing on the non-traditional security issues as my co-panelists rightly pointed out that it is actually a existential threats for human and their well-being. Um, so the concern of human security are the central um, of the struggle between the traditional and state-based and interest-based approaches and the new deteriorized and value-based approaches that focus on hum individual human beings and their health and uh, well-being and the needs. So non-traditional security, when we are talking about, we really need to keep in mind that these kind of challenges are interconnected, um, interdependent, and also mutually vulnerable vulnerabilities of security threats and it requires a collective, collaborative, human-centered approach to address. I'm not going to talk about what do you mean by in the Pacific regions because my co-panelist has already mentioned, but the only one thing that I would like to add here that this is a biogeographic region of earth seas, and it has a large number of, largest number of human beings living in the shore and in this region and in this, um, uh, uh, in this, um, uh, in the Pacific region. But also these regions are very uh, important for various reasons as my co-panelists have already addressed. I'm not going to talk that, but what I'm going to talk today is that 
it's the, the region is also a good case for us to understand how non-traditional security threats can be a threat to traditional security. As well as this region can provide us a good example uh, in terms of the global governance part, how to tackle this non-traditional security through a lens of mutual um, uh, benefit and how this communities, the countries across this Asia Pacific can deal with this traditional, non-traditional security concerns. As we have seen over the last few decades, this region has already faced multiple challenges. Those are all non-military um, non in nature. For example, financial crisis. We have seen uh, the SARS epidemic in 2003. We have seen um, catastrophic devastations brought on um, by large-scale natural disasters like Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, the multifaceted impact of the trans uh, transboundary hedge in 2015, escalation of Rohingya crisis in 2017, and the recent pandemic. So all of them are non-military in nature. So there are many more devastations are coming towards us in future. So we really need to work together in order to address those potential future threats. The population growth rates are high. Energy demands is skyrocketing due to the developmental activities in this region. The living standards are actually rising with high economic development, but resources are scarce. Ultimately, putting pressure on transboundary resources such as fisheries, shared water, and the river in this region, and gravely threaten the survival and well-being of the states and societies. So the first non-traditional security concern I would like to talk is water. There are several challenges uh, regarding the access to water in general, but also in this region. The biggest challenge is insufficient availability of fresh water to meet the demand of a rapid urbanization and extensions of the agricultural area. On top, there is a climate change, which are actually exacerbations, exacerbating the droughts and uh, um, all kinds of um, uh, environmental degradations. And also, there are lack of uh, water law in some of the countries, for example, Thailand, causing water allocation problems and upstream-downstream conflict. We all know that the water can be a source of tension or cooperation between different users. Therefore, water resources can be an act, uh, can act as a destabilizing or stabilizing influencer. The impacts how each state here in this region seeks to ensure a stable and reliable supply of water for economic development, that is a challenge. Water security um, in this region also brings dynamism. For example, we are experiencing in this region, on one hand, we observed advances in this region's water sector over the past two decades. The Republic of Korea, Japan, Singapore are global water technology leaders. Singapore can now meet up um, to up to 40% of its water demand through the recycled water. Manila, for example, a, a, a metropolitan city of 12 million people, receives a portable 24 hours water supply provided through successful private and public partnerships. The People's Republic of China is promoting the development of spawn cities. Given the fact all this positive development still almost 50 million people in the Asia and Pacific region do not have access to at least um, basic water supplies, while 1.14 billion lack access to basic sanitation. As population increasingly flow to the cities, 2.5 billion or 50% of the population will live in Asia's urban city areas by 2030. Water demand is projected to increase is about 50%. Culture, which accounts for 70% of Asia's fresh water consumptions, will need to produce much more food for growing populations, thus competing for diminishing water resources. We cannot forget the climate change realities, the natural and man-made realities that become even more relevant than ever in the effect of climate change and its likely impacts on the densely populated region. In the Asia Pacific's coastal megacities and its far-flung island nations are highly vulnerable to sea level rise, storm surges, salt water intrusion into the freshwater aquifers. 
The study shows that the potential of future tropical cyclones in this region is likely to increase climate disasters like tropical cyclones, not only threaten to displace people from uh, their homes, but can cause fatalities. And we have experienced through the, we have experienced this uh, recent influx of Rohingya refugees, how, how the humanitarian crisis can cause um, a large number of people's um, life into a threat. And most vulnerable groups, for example, children and women, how they're more vulnerably exposed to the human security. If we look at the bait, Bay of Bengal, even though 5% of the total number of global tropical cyclones originate in the Bay of Bengal, its adjacent countries, Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, experience more than 75% 75 of the total casualties worldwide. The intensity of the casualties are very, very high here in this region. With the growing importance of the region, there is now greater possibility of new infrastructure to be developed in order to make sure of the natural resources this oceanic region have. The point is, whether this will be sustainably harvested is an issue rarely discussed by and between the states. As the above evidence of the negative impacts of climate change is a reality, Unless environmental security is taken into consideration, states will be unable to protect their national securities. Resource scarcity will result in economic devastations for countries dependent on the revenue generated from these industries. Moreover, the movement of climate refugees will threaten different types of human security by giving rise to increased um, smuggling, trafficking, and movement of illegal drugs. It leads to my second point, which is the depletion of marine, res marine resources here in this region. Another threat to the existence of this region. Countries in East Asia and the Pacific are the center of the marine plastic crisis, which some countries in this region representing the biggest contributors and others disproportionately affected by the impacts of marine plastic debris on these shores. The region produces nearly half together with consuming more than one third of the total world's plastics. The future we want demand easing of the complex relation between human and oceans, especially in the light of limited Earth's ability to pack rampant human desires. The issue holds a great importance, especially for the viable development of the Asia and the Pacific region while inhibits richest pool of the living natural resources in the world. Organized crime, piracy, is another threat to this region. The maritime piracy in the Pacific is a severe problem for countries because of the sea lands in this region. More than half of the world's merchant fleet capacities sail through the Straits of Malacca, Sunda and Lombok, and the South China Sea. The Malacca Straits and the Phillips Channels are shortcuts for international ship shipping routes. Sea lanes of communication cross the waters of several countries, including Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore. With Singapore's port facilities, serving as a major mode for refueling and trans transshipment. Maritime routes are lucrative for armed struggles, smugglers, drug and human trafficking because of the volume of transfer and the laser checkpoints that can be carried out through the sea routes. While we are talking about all these non-traditional security concerns, I would like to now pay attention to the governance part. So one interesting thing that make this non-traditional securities, they have a common characteristics that at the same time make us, um, uh, make us uh, that can help us to actually frame the argument for the, for the call for the regional and joint actions. For example, these threats are transnationals in nature. They do not stem from competition between states or shift in the balance of power, but are often defined in political and socioeconomic terms. Non-traditional security issues such as resource scarcity, irregular migration, climate change can cause societal and political instability, therefore become a threat to the security. National solutions are often in inadequate, so those threats require regional and multilateral cooperations. 
The referent of security is no longer just the state here, but also the people, especially the vulnerable people living in this region. And they are mostly ignored in most of the policies. So due to the current pattern of the globalizations and technological advancement, these non-traditional security issues will become more intense and out of control and threatens the lives of countless vulnerable communities and risks the future progress upon which the societies across the world depends on. Therefore, it is imperative to look beyond the traditional security concerns that the states in these regions have often intensively focused on due to its historical reality and proximity. We do have existing several multilateral, bilateral, trilateral frameworks in uh, working in this region. For example, ASEAN Regional Forum, the Blue Dot Network, Indian Ocean Rim Associations. Those frameworks can be used, expanded its focus to the non-traditional security issues more than even ever before. It is very important that these associations tackle these non-traditional security issues combinedly and jointly. We have seen good examples. We have seen ASEAN, uh, ASEAN agreement on disaster management and emergency responses serves as the policy backbone for the member states to enhance their collective efforts in reducing disaster risk and responding to disasters in this region. Also, we have seen the ASEAN plan of action against trafficking in persons, especially women and children. It has become a policy tool for most of the countries here in these member states. Also, the blue dot networks, which the United States and its allies introduced these networks in 2019 to promote infrastructure development, the Blue Dot mark, uh, Marketplace could help countries achieve sustainable infrastructure by identifying potential impacts on food security, disasters, and health. Indian Ocean Rim Associations, we have seen, they have recently had a meeting in 2021. This platform should strengthen corporations to combat non-traditional security threats in the Indian Ocean region and can set up a permanent working group on maritime safety and security. Beanstick, we do have a framework and they have done a good job on fighting against terrorism and organized international crime as one of the most important prerequisites for sustainable growth. Their knowledge, the, the, the facility cooperation in terms of capacity building through sharing of knowledge and technical knowledge, um, creating a disaster response force and allocating funds is very important. Recent Quad Agenda, the broader Quad Agenda that covers cooperation in non-military areas, such as critical technologies and material, reliable supply chains, infrastructure, artificial intelligence, cyber issues, COVID response. This can be including, and in addition, climate change can include selected Asian countries on issues-based cooperations here. India, Japan, Australia trilateral is also a good example which can be used, which can be expanded. Their agenda can be expanded and include the non-traditional security issues and also countries those are vulnerable, especially in the South Asia. So the, this trilateral, multilateral groupings, as well as groupings, bilateral synergy among like-minded nations are key development shaping the new regional order. Countries in this region should pursue regional strategies and action plans that will address the various non-traditional security threats that they face. Both state and non-state actors could build on existing regional framework and initiatives and create more targeted function-based cooperations, which is very important, function-based cooperation. To date, there is no comprehensive transboundary framework in this Asia-Pacific region. States are mostly trying to deal issues individually at the national scale, despite many of them recognizing the need for a frame of cooperations. That lead to my second, the governance structure, which needs to expand. We need a system that, that we also need to go beyond the state-centric. We need to go down to the people, the vulnerable communities, the countries, individual. 
their involvement is very much needed, which means people-centric approach that we are missing here in this region. There is where technology, the non-traditional security is an area where technology and politics uh, intersect. Because for example, climate change and tackling climate change is enormous expensive. And, it, and so the companies who do not want to bear it, the government, are not sure they can bear it together. But we are pretty sure it is not going better if we do not do it now. So the climate change has also given us a challenge and also an opportunity to work together because these challenges are transnational, these challenges are interconnected. So the state needs to look forward in new adaptive strategies through coordination between each other to build resilience among vulnerable communities and increase their adaptive capacities. Cognitive society is very much important. The society need to, this intellectual, the research community, the cognitive community needs to come together, invest more on research so that they can put a pressure on that across the countries. At the same time, some countries needs to take the responsibilities, come forward to provide support in research and innovations and support the vulnerable communities and states in this region. I stop here and I'm looking forward for a nice discussions. Marufa, thank you very much for your presentation. You very rightly point out some of the most important issues of the region. And you also very rightly point out the linkages between non-traditional security and how fast they can graduate to traditional security. In our region, for example, look at the issue of the Indus Water Treaty between India and Pakistan. Water stresses is also putting a stress on that treaty. A treaty that has survived wars, has been underwritten by the World Bank, is again under tremendous stress of breaking down. And imagine breaking down of a treaty of sensitive nature on water between two nuclear-powered countries with a history of conflict. Again, come back and look at the tension that is brewing between India and China over sharing of the Brahmaputra water, of which we are also a sharer. If that tension grows to a point where it cannot be resolved, we could be looking at the prospect of a hydro conflict. And a hydro conflict in the region can completely destabilize the whole in the Pacific region. The region is also home to a very large number of people, and we also have very large number of displaced people in the region. There are 4.2 million refugees in the region, 4.1 IDPs in the region. There are 2.4 million recorded stateless people in the region. So all, all these counts, we have serious issues of concern, and they need to be addressed both by nations and on a transnational basis. With that, I will open the floor now for your questions, comments, observations, anything that you would like to say. The floor is open. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Anwar, if you have anything to say. Please introduce yourself. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> good uh, afternoon. Uh, my name is Anu Anwar. Uh, I'm a fellow with Harvard University, and uh, my research is also related to this topic. So I think I would just briefly like to know from the speaker that um, uh, the previous gentleman who asked the question about uh, democracy versus non-democracy. Uh, <clears throat> is the democracy in our region is doing enough? To, uh, to, to tackle the challenge such as Rohingya crisis. Because we know uh, that our regional democratic country, although European or American democracy is doing uh, as we expect, but what our regional countries are doing. So uh, is there anything Bangladesh can do uh, to get a bit more support from them? Thank you. 
Well, I'm Sir David Dosan from Eastwest University. I'm a student. So we can see the new strategy of US, which is the IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, where already 13 to 14 Asian countries have joined. This strategy will account 40 percent of the world GDP, according to US. Well, surely US wants to do a big in this region by entering into Pacific Club, as they already lost allies and perhaps allies and partners after the harmful decision back in 2017 by withdrawing the Trans-Pacific Partnership. On the other hand, China is running the BRI project very smoothly and smartly, not only in Asia but also in Middle East. So now the question is, uh, is the, this two big strategies, IPEF and BRI made by US and China, is there any possibility of economic clash among the countries and normal citizens of life and uh, is there any possibility of doing any type, any type of harms to this non-traditional secret system just because of this economic clash? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will uh, seek the responses from our speakers at this moment, then come back to you again for the next cluster of questions. So, Mahmoud, you can start first. I'll be very brief. Uh, first, to start with uh, Mr. Roach, um, he says that a future will be dominated by science and technology. It is very well known. But where he emphasizes is the building of institution. Unless we build the institutions, then probably we will not be able to address the issues of non-traditional security threats because they span transnational boundaries. And the most important thing is about institution. When you have the institution in place, you also have the urgency to work with your neighbors provided neighbors also have the institutions well intact in their places. I'll give you an example from my own experience uh, when I was the High Commissioner of Bangladesh in Brunei Darussalam. So I'm talking about the institution of migration. There used to be about 20 to 25,000 people, workers. Now, each worker had to pay close to about, say, Shariti Lakh rupees. But dollars in terms of, I mean, a certain amount of money uh, which he had to pay, which was too high compared to the, in fact, uh, I mean, money which was uh, decided by the government that he should pay at the time of going as a migrant worker, unskilled worker to Brunei. Later on, we found out that almost about 60 to 70,000 people were there registered as unskilled workers, but actually 16,000 were only employed which means that against each and every migrant worker, there was money extracted, but they did not get any job, which means that these two countries did not have proper institutions in place for controlling the migrant workers working in target countries. Clear? This is what is most important money. You are paying in the hope that we were saying that we are getting so much of revenue, so much of revenue. That is in terms of increasing your revenue in the national budget, but what is happening to the social security aspect of those unskilled workers who went there and did not find their jobs and later on they were again smuggled out from Brunei to the neighboring countries like Indonesia or say Australia uh, in the hope of changing their future. So this is what is important for institution building uh, f uh, f uh, in case of uh, non-traditional threats. Now. Uh, second question was similar, like Mr. Anwar also stressed on the need for democracy, but uh, democracy, what kind of democracy we are following, that is important. Is it a democracy which is in fact used by the political parties to gain their power, or it is a democracy which reads and understands and comprehends the well-being of each individual in the society? I have seen, in fact, undemocratic country performing very well uh, in terms of providing security to its citizens. Brunei might be small, but it's a good example. They don't have democracy. We can talk about Singapore. Singapore doesn't have foolproof democracy, but Singapore stands out to be one of the five premier institutions in the world in global aviation. So democracy itself uh, is having no meaning unless it is practiced. We have seen one or two in history monarchical states which have performed very well. Napoleon was not democratic, but Napoleon gave civil rights code to Europe, which is still persisting. 
So it depends not merely on democracy, but what kind of leaders also you produced in the world. We have such institutions at World Bank, IMF, through United Nations, which were in fact produced by the intervention of the economic leaders and political leaders of those times, and still we are reaping the benefits of these multilateral institutions. So democracy alone is not the answer. Third, Mr. Kamal has talked about government has no plan. Government might be having plan, but the political leaders staying on ground, they are not acting or reacting. It is not the fault with the plan itself, it is the fault with the individual and the culture in which our politics have evolved in the last few years. We have not seen opposition also taking any kind of lead in coming to the aid or alleviation of, uh, uh, I mean, affliction due to floods. And finally, will BRI and IPF will conflict and create problem for non-traditional security tricks? Both, in my personal opinion, are good initiatives. Both address non-traditional security threats. But the point is that it is a great power politics and their hegemony will tell you in future where these two institutions will move. Thank you. Hello. Um, I think um, so we have covered most of the points, but going back to the democracy um, concern that you've raised, um, I agree with Sir that what kind of democracy we are talking about, but I think when you're talking about the interventions and in addressing non-traditional security issues, democracy in a sense of participations of all countries Communities, especially vulnerable communities, is very important. As I have mentioned, the people-centric approach is very important because most of the vulnerable people and community living in the, in the Pacific shores are the most vulnerable communities. Their participation is very much important. And of course, yeah, I agree with you in some extent that internal um, um, democracy, that in, democracy within the countries also important, it can provide us, but as we see, we have also seen a good examples of non-democratic countries ensuring the civil rights of the citizens. Um, and um, um, second point, the, I, I would like to show, mention the third, last one, the economic clash between these two power, big power. Yes, it can be a challenging, but also we can take leverage out of this, especially the small countries, especially the vulnerable countries, can use this opportunity to, uh, to bring these two big powers for more investment in these regions. And those networks, those collaborations, those frameworks have non-traditional security concerns included already. So yeah, this is my brief <coughs> comments. Any, any other questions? Okay, please. Independent Brazil is now the gravity of center of the current world politics. We see that dominant powers of the region, such as India, China, and US have different versions of views to the region. For example, India has launched a strong norm-setting agenda and wants an integrated region with no hierarchy, I mean, uh, multiple uh, uh, characteristic of the region. China wants to establish the regional hegemony with an aggressive approach. However, USA has a strict norm-setting agenda in democratic and neoliberal terms. I appreciate this, surely. The different views are a big challenge, however, in encountering non-traditional security threats in the region. So my question is, what should be the approach for the small and middle powers of the region to pursue the dominant powers to collectively encounter non-traditional security threats? Thank you, Bonus. Thank you. Yes, would you like to ask a question? Okay. okay. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. I had a question to Dr. Marufa, ma'am. I wanted to ask that to what extent can uh, traditional media, such as television, newspaper, and so on, contribute to the non-traditional security threats? Thank you. Sorry, could you repeat the question? I wanted to ask that to what extent can traditional media such as newspapers, international television channels such as Al Jazeera, CNN, BBC, 
can contribute to the non-traditional security threats. Okay, thank you. Professor, you have the floor. Microphone, please. Just one moment. Oh. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for a very uh, interesting discussion and giving us uh, coverage of non-traditional security threats that are um, in the Indo-Pacific region. I, I just have a minor uh, sort of intervention. Uh, when we talk about Bangladesh, yes, uh, many of you might have seen the latest publication in FT.com about uh, how Bangladeshis are being uh, are struggling due to a global crisis. So uh, uh, in that article, as well as a number of articles that were published in last two years, that how the pattern used to be before um, uh, from uh, rural areas, people would migrate to urban areas, but the uh, pandemic has actually shifted the trend. Um, so the, uh, now there are, you know, urban population, they're going back to the rural areas, and that, has, that is creating a different kind of crisis for big cities. And something that I find very interesting challenge uh, as a non-traditional security threat, because at one hand, uh, the urban areas, they're losing service sector people, those who are very essential for the city to go. But on the other hand, people who are going back in the rural areas, they have their own coping mechanism with food crisis and other sort of crisis. So this is something I think it's time that we need to sort of work more on highlighting that how can we fight non-traditional security because often we talk about big data uh, like in terms of you know balance of payment and other issues macroeconomic issues but we do not look at what are the survival mechanism in rural areas for people for which you know all the predictions of you know uh, there will be uh, a lot of um, uh, violent extremism because people do not have jobs there will be a lot of you know famine uh, there will be a lot of deaths due to uh, lack of availability to food but that has we have not seen that like when the Rohingyas came in 2017 that was one of the biggest predictions that okay uh, there would be radicalization in the camps we have not seen that happening so what is what is different that Bangladeshis are doing what is different that are uh, that poor people in different parts of the world especially in the in the Pacific region they are doing and what are their survival mechanism that is something I feel that as uh, uh, Dr. Marufa has pointed out that um, we need to not only take a people-centric approach, but look at the grassroots level survival mechanism, a very understudied area because it's not an attractive area to fund. Uh, so this is something that I would like to point uh, our attention to. Thank you. Thank you. Very good point, Lailufar. Any other questions? Yes, please. I can't see you, but I can see your hand. Thank you for giving me the floor. I am Tamim Manzur from East West University. My question is, what are the future of Rohingya infiltration of Bangladesh? Aren't they creating non-traditional security threats? We can see they are adding themselves with drug trafficking, making fake identity, and they are victim of human trafficking also. That's all. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Marzuka, you can have, you can have the next question. Please stand up and ask the question. Um, Assalamu alaikum and good morning to everyone. I had a question with regards to um, the different military uh, coalitions in the Indo-Pacific region, such as Quad. Uh, they have come together and assured with regards to um, reducing the emissions of carbon footprint of the literal states in the region according to the Paris Agreement. But to how far, uh, like how much can we expect it to be effective? And how much does it work with regards to our institutions in the region? Thank you. Thank you. Salam alaikum. I am Shamir. I'm currently working as a lecturer in the Department of International Relations at Bangladesh University of Professionals. So before I put my question forward, I just would like to pitch my two cents and that I have worked in Shatkira region for quite a long time, uh, quite some time, and I have visited that area in um, Gaborini and in Kaira and Shamnagar Upazila for a couple of times, and I have seen how the uh, initiatives taken by NGOs and government agencies uh, to tackle climate change and in terms of water uh, salination plants were undone by a single climate catastrophe like Amphan. And because of that, we have seen that there is a huge gap in terms of resilience efforts. I mean, government is taking steps to establish some sort of uh, 
mechanism to fight climate change or maybe I mean to desalinize waters but those things are being undone by a single climatic uh, catastrophe and these things are going to be more um, frequent in the coming future so what can Bangladesh government do in terms of I mean sustaining this uh, initiatives so that I mean they do not uh, get affected by damages every uh, flood season or every season there is, uh, every time there is a cyclone or something like that. At the same time, I mean, in Shatkira and in other parts of southern parts of Bangladesh, there are a huge number of climate uh, migrants and refugees, which you have already pointed out. Uh, but, I mean, there is an issue of securitization. Uh, we all know about that. And in a report in 2019 by U.S. Army War College uh, titled the Implications of Climate Change for the U.S. Military, and it was, Bangladesh was termed almost 10 times there, uh, and how bang, uh, the migration and IDPs and, in fact, trans-border migration of Bangladeshi uh, climate refugees can become a security threat, and how the U.S. Army can have to, I mean, may have to intervene in that period. So how can Bangladesh government, in fact, utilize this idea of uh, securitization so that the not only government officials at the top, but also local leaders uh, in the lo lower level can take initiatives to combat climate change in a much rigorous manner. Thank you. All right, we'll go back to our speakers again for the last uh, answers and the last comments they have. We'll start with you again, Mahmood. Thank you, sir. So most of your comments, what I understand Mr. Rushda said, it was his understanding that democracy is the ultimate panacea. But again, uh, democracy, has got, democracy has got many forms. You can be a democratic authoritarian person also. Uh, a second uh, democracy also flourished under Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore. That is a kind of a democracy. We have democracy in India also under President, uh, Prime Minister Modi. But uh, the democracy in the sense which does not take every individual in the society as an in itself, in fact, functions not effectively. That was my point. And uh, as I have said, uh, I mean, told you about the incident in which um, I felt very badly that we could not establish the institution of migrant workers between, uh, between Brunei and Bangladesh only because there was greed element in it. But those who were involved, uh, I, uh, one of those, uh, say, agents, they were all democratic, in fact, persons. They were all democratic persons holding high appointments even. So this is the point. The every time a democracy may not function, one individual can, as a statement, matter a lot in bringing about the changes in the world. Uh, second point is that uh, uh, non-traditional security threats, in fact, are a vast area. Now, this is very difficult to resolve each and every crisis. What is most important is for the state to go about with strategy making because its sources are also limited. So you have to have the funding available with you. Take the case of climate change. At times the funding is not available so you cannot in fact deal with the climate problems uh, accurately. But if we look at some of the points of sustainable development goals of the United Nations, we'll find the answers to many of these non-traditional security challenges. I might not call them as threat. And there is a gentleman who also talked about securitization. In fact, for securitization, you have to find out the sectors. Military is a sector, right? Environmental is a sector. Societal issues are another sector. Then your political dilemma is also a sector. Say, take the case of terrorism. It is in itself uh, both a non-traditional security challenge and traditional security challenge. Take the case of migrant Rohingyas. It is both a traditional challenge and a non-traditional challenge. From traditional challenge point of view, because we could not put up a very good deterrence policy or threat to them, that's why my military general had the guts to push them in as many as three times. And every time they went squat free. So what is important is for the state to decide whether it will have a security strategy for itself or not. And for that, you need National Security Council. Because it is the National Security Council which will be able to tell if it says regularly that what is the impending security now, what is going to come in another two to three years. So long you will not have this in any state, there will no, never be a strategic paper coming out. I like say, uh, 
Professor Lidefer has said that we even do not know in case of migrating from people, in case of migrating people from village to the city, uh, from urban area to the rural area, what kind of social security challenges we might face because there has not been any study so long. So, thank you very much. Hello. Okay. Um, so there is a question from here that what media can be um, can contribute? How media can contribute to non-traditional security issues? I think today's session is also a good example where we do this sessions as a media partner. Like what media can do? Media can do can find out, identify the risks, and also present it in front of the people, in front of the countries to bring awareness. So building awareness, building um, 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 and also mobilizations, not only bringing on your own information, but also monitor, also tracking those security concerns is very much important. So when we have to teach or we have to talk in some issues, what do we do? We go to newspapers, we do check what kind of data are available. So I think from, from the data point of view, media has a big role to, um, to do here. So going back to this data, when we are talking about non-traditional security, Sai has rightly pointed out um, many of the points, but also lack of information, because this non-traditional security issues have not been researched a lot because it's a very dynamic. It has a different dynamic, socio-economic, political dynamics. It needs to find out, identify each problem. It's a vast. So data, source of information, and sharing among the states is very much important because these threats cannot be dealt by a single state, even if it is a powerful state. That's given. So they need powerful states even need support. At the same time, there's another question here, like what to do with the small states, how they can actually find or tackle these non-traditional securities when there's a two big power are uh, competing over economics, economy. Um, yes, this is a challenge, but also uh, in, the, in the foreign policy of small states, we do have the terminology called hedging. Like you really need to find out the opportunities and um, uh, keep talking, keep uh, communicating, and then part of public diplomacy is very much important. Keep telling your challenges, showing the research, presenting, and asking for help is also very important. That brings to uh, my second point is partnerships. So it's very much important, the partnerships. I think we have covered, um, yeah, the role of the community is, you mentioned that there are a threat, uh, non-traditional security threats as well. Yes, as I mentioned, is a security threat and non-traditional security threats, but I would like to point out more into the Rohingya community because the threats, the securitizations approaches exist in the community and the society that they are the threat. But most importantly, their life is under threat. We are not even thinking about their, these people's, their people's well-being, living, are under threat. So yes, um, refugee crisis can cause um, a harm for the communities and also what kind, like when we talk about the communities, there is a different. Also there are different versions of threats. Gender, when you talk about the women's vulnerabilities are much more higher than the male communities. And also the children are much more, so there is a dynamics. Even the community, not even the community, within the community there are more vulnerable people. So we really need to talk about that. Thank you, Marufa, for, the, for your answers. Uh, I would not like to summarize the very rich discussion we had this morning, except saying that the landscape of non-traditional security is very vast particularly in the in the Pacific region, where countries all over the in the Pacific region are extremely vulnerable to the threat. It needs for a comprehensive approach to address these issues. Most of our countries don't have a, a laid out comprehensive security strategy. So therefore, many of these issues are addressed in a ad hoc basis. We need a further deeper understanding of the issues so that we can have a national strategy 
and we, our national strategies can fit into the transnational cooperation mechanisms that we can build. And that is completely lacking now. Bangladesh in particular is very, very vulnerable to some of the major threats we have discussed here. So as national security planners anywhere, we need to address these issues on an urgent basis. It is also important for us to say that many of the interventions to address the issues would be non-military in nature. It is not prudent to prematurely securitize them. And over-securitization can be harmful. So many of the interventions and responses have to be addressed in a manner that they are addressed on a social, political, and economic levels and not securitized. And in any case, none of this should be ever militarized. Many of the countries are very prone to this approach of militarization, and that is an approach that should be avoided at any cost. Well, with that very brief remarks, I shall now turn it over to our co-host, Mr. Zafar Sovan, editor of Tribune. Thank you very much, General. And, uh, thank you to our speakers, and thank you to all of those of you who have taken time out of your busy morning to be with us for this extremely rich discussion. Before I sum up, I just thought I would also like to address uh, an issue which was raised by one of the questioners about um, media and the role media can play. And I think it's very interesting because media can really be a double-edged sword when it comes to issues of human security in a country. And uh, the question, if I understand it correctly, I sort of asked, you know, could uh, you know, media be part of the threat and part or part of the solution? And I think it can be both. And we've seen in certain countries where the media, both traditional and non-traditional, and when we talk about media, I think it's very important in the year 2022 to not really draw this distinction between traditional and non-traditional media, because as far as they are consumed by your um, your, your, your average citizen. The average citizen really does not make that distinction. You are um, imbibing information media from various sources, some traditional, some non, and you will probably see these on your social media and give them equal weight. So both of those need to be looked at um, uh, together. And if you see, for instance, the, uh, the genocide and ethnic cleansing in Myanmar, which um, preceded uh, uh, the exodus uh, to here in Bangladesh in 2017, we're talking of the most recent one, really was fueled by a media campaign online in both traditional and non-traditional media. We've also seen um, on our other border in India a very negative role being played um, both, again, by non-traditional and traditional media in whipping up sentiments, uh, anti-minority sentiments, all kinds of things. So we really see that um, in this interconnected day and age, media can play a role. That said, if media is freed, they can also play a very positive role. And I think certainly, and this gets back to the point I think uh, Professor Marufa made uh, in her response uh, to this, you have to allow the media to play its role as the monitor. Um, to be able to gather information. And we are really the canary in the coal mine as there are threats to a country, non-traditional security threats, other kinds of threats. It'll first really show up, the information, the data, um, in the media. And so if you have a vibrant media which has the freedom to report on these problems, that can really be your early warning signal that there are things which need to be addressed. Whereas if a media is muzzled and is discouraged from, from uh, reporting on such issues, that is a very vital source of information which is then sacrificed and lost by government, which makes it then very, very hard for them to actually address these issues which desperately need addressing until it may be too late. So I think that's the uh, point I try to make on the uh, interaction between media and, uh, and, and, and uh, non-traditional security threats, taking the advantage of my, uh, my role here as moderator. Just in conclusion, I think there's very little for me to add to what both the speakers as well as the general has mentioned. Um, really, we, BIPs and Dhaka Tribune, have been doing this speaker series almost a year now, it's about nine or ten months, and we've really focused on security issues, uh, um, um, 
in the region. And I think it was high time actually for us to talk about non-traditional security issues, because as has come out in this discussion, you really can't separate the two. You see, the two are inextricably linked. And it's really kind of a question of emphasis, of, of, of recognition, of, of, of the prism through which we throw, uh, look at these issues. And I think it makes a lot of sense to look at issues such as you know, climate change, um, food, water, disaster, fishing. We've tended to look at these as issues of challenges which have to be faced. I think one of the speakers had mentioned that there's a lot of overlap between the, um, uh, the SDGs uh, and the issues we've been talking about. But I do think it is important to put them under the rubric of security and non-traditional security because ultimately when we talk about them, they are as important to the individual and as much of a threat to people's lives and livelihoods is more traditional threats. And I think what's really important, and again has come through in this discussion, is that uh, these are threats which cannot really be, um, you know, cannot really be addressed solely by any single government. Okay, and I think that's one big difference. Oftentimes when we look at security issues, there's a bit of a zero-sum game. So what could be good for one country is maybe negative for another. But when we come to non-traditional security threats, that actually speaks to our common humanity um, is uh, inhabitants of this planet. And almost all of the non-traditional security threats which we've discussed here, and of course we've only scratched the surface because as has been mentioned, there's many more which we could have discussed and haven't really had the opportunity. These are all issues which we can only address, we can only resolve if we work together. And um, this was in fact also a point made by uh, the Air Vice Marshal. He said, even within um, within Bangladesh, for instance, if you want to bring this discussion back to those of us sitting here, we need to have much more coordination and um, a comprehensive strategy, and I think the general mentioned this as well. Instead of addressing these issues on an ad hoc basis, one at a time, piecemeal, we need to understand that they fit into a greater rubric of security, human security, personal security, individual security, non-traditional security. If we understand it that way, then we will hopefully give these issues the urgency and the importance that they deserve in our discussions and our policy making moving forward. Thank you very much. Well, before we end, uh, please join me in giving a big hand to our speakers this morning. And thank you all very much for coming. And this is our monthly series with Dhaka Tribune. Again, we should be hoping to see you next month to talk about another strategic and a security issues of interest. And please coming back, come back to our events every month where we talk about key issues facing the region. Please join us for a cup of coffee outside. Thank you.